This is the video lecture for the physiology of the digestive system. So when we think of the digestive system, we're thinking of a system that was its primary responsibility is to break down and absorb the nutrients we take in from our food and send it to the blood. And then the, digest or the circulatory system or the cardiovascular system's job is to take that blood and deliver it to our cells. So the main function is to break down and absorb the nutrients and water that we take in via our mouth. So this is a nice video covering the functions of each organ within the digestive tract. So we'll go ahead and look at this video here. Just a brief overview of the digestive system. The primary functions of the digestive system are the breakdown of food, called digestion, and absorption of nutrients. Digestion begins in the mouth, where the teeth break food into smaller particles during mastication. Salivary glands, located near the oral cavity, secrete saliva, which begins chemical digestion and keeps the food moist. As food is swallowed, the soft palate blocks the upper pharynx to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity, and multiple voluntary muscles in the face, neck, and tongue contract pushing food particles through the pharynx. The food passes over the epiglottis, which prevents food entry into the respiratory system, and then into the esophagus, which connects the pharynx to the stomach. The one-way movement of the food mass, now called a bolus, is controlled by wave-like involuntary muscle contractions. This movement is known as peristalsis. The bolus now enters the stomach, Folds in the stomach wall, called rugae, allow for expansion as the stomach fills. Stomach cells secrete hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, and various regulatory hormones that chemically digest the bolus. Muscular contractions in the stomach churn its contents to further break down the bolus and mix it with stomach secretions to form a thick liquid called chyme. Chyme exits the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and enters the small intestine, the major site of nutrient absorption. The small intestine consists of three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Bile from the liver and digestive enzymes from the pancreas empty into the duodenum to aid in digestion. Absorbed nutrients pass from the lumen of the small intestine into blood and lymph. Chyme not absorbed in the small intestine enters the large intestine. As it passes through the cecum and ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, water and salts are absorbed and chyme is converted into feces. The rectum stores feces until nervous stimulation initiates the defecation reflex, resulting in elimination through the anal canal. So it would be a good idea to go through this quiz and see if you got the main information from that little video overview. So moving back to our PowerPoint, looking at the anatomy of the digestive tract, we talked about this in the lab portion of the class. And we know that the main digestive tract is made up of these structures here, the only one that's um, not shown here is the rectum and that's at the end of the large intestine so don't forget that the rectum is before the anus but it's basically a straight shot as far as food goes in through the mouth and comes out through the anus and there should not be any break in that digestive tract because if there is that would definitely cause infection because we know our food is not sterile as we bring it into the mouth so therefore it's important that this digestive tract remain intact because there's sterile tissues around it that would be uh, infected if there was a break in the digestive tract. Some examples of breaks in the digestive tract might be um, a, an ulcer in the esophagus. We can see ulcers in the stomach, ulcers in the small intestine. A perforated colon or perforated bowel can cause a break which would release stool into the abdominal cavity. And a common problem that we see among younger people is a problems with the appendix and a ruptured appendix. If that appendix ruptures, that releases stool into the abdominal cavity and can cause a serious infection. That would be treated by antibiotics. So if we look at the upper 
gastrointestinal system or upper GI tract. A couple of processes are occurring here. Ingestion means we're bringing food into the mouth or the stomach. So we're bringing it specifically into the body. So the end result is it's in the stomach. Once something has been ingested, that product or that substance is in the stomach. The process of breaking down food in the mouth, we call that mastication. So chewing takes that food substance and breaks it down into smaller and smaller pieces. Then the saliva can act on it and the enzymes in the saliva can act on it and begin digestion. Propulsion is just the muscular movement of food through the digestive tract. Swallowing includes propulsion, or is an example, I should say, of propulsion. So we have muscular contractions that move that food down our pharynx into our esophagus. And a very common uh, term that we see throughout the digestive tract is what's called peristalsis. And peristalsis is wave-like smooth muscle contractions that propel our food through our digestive tract. So again, thinking of them as, as waves of contraction and relaxation that propel food forward through the digestive tract. In the lower digestive tract, we see more breakdown of food, which we call mixing, which is contractions within the small intestine. We see food moving back and forth. We also see this in the stomach as food is moved back and forth through muscular contractions on one side of the stomach. Um, to the other to again increase the surface area for the enzymes for hydrochloric acid to act on this food to further break it down into the, its smaller parts. We see secretion along the digestive tract. We see secretion of mucus, secretion of enzymes to help digest the food and again to further liquefy it. Digestion is the process of breaking down larger food molecules into smaller food molecules. Examples would be taking proteins and breaking them down to amino acids because our cells can only absorb these smaller uh, breakdown molecules such as amino acids. Complex carbohydrates are breaking, broken down into glucose. Um, fat is broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. So those are some of the things that our cells need but they need, must be broken down, they must be digested in order for them to absorb out of the um, digestive tract into the blood. So the process of absorption is moving from the GI tract into the blood or into the lymphatic system. And elimination is just our body's way of getting rid of the waste products that we don't use from the food we take into our body. So the digestive processes are, are well regulated by the nervous system and also by hormones that are secreted within the digestive tract. Um, the nervous system, recall the autonomic nervous system, the Division, subdivision of that is the parasympathetic nervous system we talked about. It's the rest and digest system. Um, so there are a couple of, primarily the vagus nerve um, serves the digestive tract and allows for digestion to occur. So when we're relaxing, the parasympathetic nervous system is dominating and that promotes peristalsis and hormone secretions and other gastric and enteric small intestine secretions that support digestion. Digestion begins in the mouth for substances that contain starch and one of the enzymes uh, that we see in the mouth is amylase and amylase is secreted by the saliva, it's found in the saliva and it breaks down starch. So a baby without teeth can actually break down a saltine cracker or a Ritz cracker or a graham cracker with the help of amylase. So that we say um, digestion begins in the mouth with starchy foods like I mentioned crackers and, and breads as long as they're not whole wheat and contain those other um, grains that need more um, enzyme action than just amylase. Also what we see in the saliva are antibacterial agents. It also contains mucus to help lubricate our food. So all those things are very important for digestion. So for patients that have um, a, an NG tube, for example, they may have less salivary gland production and as a result they're, um, they need good oral care, they need good lubrication of their oral cavity, and there are products that we provide to patients to help with their oral health when they're um, having gastric suctioning. 
So we look at the muscular organs then that receive the food from the mouth, and the first one is the pharynx. We talked about in lab the different regions of the pharynx. We don't want food entering the nasopharynx, so that's protected by the uvula. But the oral pharynx is what receives the food from the mouth after it's chewed and then propels it down the esophagus, toward the esophagus to the stomach. So the esophagus doesn't have any digestive role. Its only job is just to transport the food from the throat the pharynx to the stomach. There are sphincters at the top and bottom of the esophagus which helps control movement in and out of the esophagus into the stomach. And um, a common problem, not common, but a what we see a problem in some people is um, hernias or weakenings of these sphincters and that can cause acid reflux or a um, what's called a hiatal hernia where a portion of the stomach actually projects upward into the esophagus. So the process of swallowing begins in the mouth with voluntary chewing and then projecting that food backward toward the throat and then from there it becomes a reflex. There's an esophageal reflex and a cardioesoph um and a um esoph sorry, a pharyngeal reflex and a esophageal reflex that propels that food down toward the stomach. So once we push that food to the back of our throat, we can't get that food to come up again because it's reflexes that stimulate muscle contractions that continue it down toward the stomach. So once that food reaches the stomach, we ta already talked about the rugae that are the wrinkles in the stomach wall that allow the stomach wall to stretch when food enters it. But within the stomach wall, we see these pits in the surface of the stomach wall that's lined with simple columnar cells. And some of these cells you'll see are a different color because they have a unique function for digestion. Some of these cells near the surface here secrete mucus. As we get a little further down we see more mucus cells. And then as we get a little further in we see some cells that their job is to secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Both of these play a role in digestion. Um, intrinsic factor is important for absorbing vitamin B vitamin B12 specifically. Some of these cells lower in the pits of the diet of the stomach wall are called chief cells and their job is to produce pepsinogen which will be converted to pepsin which helps break down protein. So we do see some protein digestion occurring in the stomach. And then we also have endocrine cells and the endocrine cells are cells that secrete some of the hormones that help regulate digestion. And the primary hormone secreted by the stomach is gastrin. So when we look at the action of digestion, there's a couple of different things that can stimulate it. The first picture here tells us that just thinking or smelling or seeing food can cause our stomach to start to secrete digestive hormones. And if you've ever talked about or seen a piece of cake and you're a little bit hungry, you may feel your mouth getting to fill with saliva as that digestive process begins. And that's just thinking about food. Here we can see in this picture just the stretch of the stomach wall can stimulate the digestive processes. So once food enters the stomach, that begins the digestive processes. In here, looking at the pH or presence of fat in the chyme that leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine, that too can stimulate or I should say affect digestion. In this case, it decreases the digestive secretions to slow um, the digestive processes down. And you can see how this would be important, for example, if someone was wanting to slow their digestive processes, slow absorption down. For example, college students are going downtown to have fun with their friends in the bars on a Saturday night. By having some food here, some fattier foods, say for example pizza, in the stomach, that's going to slow the absorption of that alcohol into the small intestine. And that's a wise idea for people that are going to go out and spend an entire night entire night going to the bars to have some food in their stomach, especially something with some fat, to help slow that absorption of the alcohol into their small intestine. So once food is in the stomach, the job of the stomach is to mechanically break down that food by mixing and peristalsis, pushing the food downward and then upward, back and forth in the stomach to turn it into a liquid called chyme. C-H-Y-M-E is how we spell that. So primary function of the stomach is to liquefy food into this substance called chyme. And again, there is a small amount of protein digestion that begins in the stomach as well, but primary job is to mix and break down that food into a liquid um, 
consistency for the small intestine then to be able to absorb those components after it's further digested. So here we can see there's a sphincter at the bottom of the stomach that allows just a few milliliters of this chyme to enter the small intestine at one time. That allows for slow uh, absorption and maximizing the nutrients we obtain from that food. So in the small intestine, the first part of the small intestine to receive the substances from the stomach is the duodenum. And the duodenum is an is a important section of the small intestine because we'll see that the pancreas and the liver and gallbladder also secrete some contents here to promote digestion. So when we talk about where most digestion and absorption occurs, that is going to be in the small intestine, beginning in the duodenum and ending in the ileum. So some of the secretions we see in the small intestine is, again, mucus, because we want to make sure that those uh, that low pH chyme, as it enters from the stomach, from uh, with all the hydrochloric acid that it's ex exposed to in the stomach, want to make sure that doesn't break down and destroy the walls of the small intestine. So uh, healthy mu mucus production protects the walls of the stomach as well as the small intestine from this low pH chyme. Then the pH will slowly increase as we have um, different components added to the uh, small intestine, pancreatic juice for one, and um, different enzymes, again, are going to continue to break down these food products. So again, disacchar disaccharidases are going to break the sugars down into smaller sugars, peptidases breaking the proteins down into amino acids, and nucleases breaking these nucleic acids down into nucleotides. We have other glands of the duodenum, again, that secrete hormones that will stimulate um, or slow the process of digestion depending on what the pH and contents of the stomach are. So um, again, again, I said there's a couple of organs that add their own secretions to the duodenum to help with digestion. One of those is the liver. The liver makes bile, and bile is important for breaking down fats. Some of the bile that is produced by the liver is stored in a small little green structure that's tucked underneath the right side of the liver, and that's the gallbladder. So the gallbladder simply stores bile that is produced by the liver. So the, the gallbladder doesn't make the bile, it just stores the bile. And that's an important function, again, for breaking down fats in our diet. So again, there's several different functions of the liver. We didn't talk about the liver, um, but it does uh, play other accessory roles. It produces proteins and clotting factors and heparin. It has special cells to keep um, our blood um, infection free. But again, um, that's more of a circular, accessory um, circulatory role. It helps to detoxify the blood. It helps to convert nutrients. Um, storing of glycogen, which helps us store excess sugar that we get from our diet, uh, stores fat, vitamins, copper, and iron, but primarily the digestive role, like I said, is producing bile, which helps us break down fat. So the gallbladder stores that bile, and then when we eat a, something um, that contains fat, that stimulates the gallbladder to release that bile via the common bile duct to the duodenum to break down that bile. So some people end up with gallstones if they have a high fat diet or they go on a, on a diet and lose too much weight too quickly. They end up with gallstones and can end up getting their ball, gallbladder having to be removed. The pancreas, its digestive job is to create and secrete enzymes that are going to be released into the duodenum. And these enzymes, again, will break down the food into the smaller components. So some of these enzymes break down proteins, some sugars, some fats, some nucleic acids, all very important to get those tiny molecules that can be absorbed by the walls of the small intestine. So the pancreas is essential for breaking down and digesting the products in our food into an absorbable molecule. So once all of the nutrients are obtained from our food, food enters into the large intestine right at this portion here through a valve. So here would be where the ileum would connect to the large intestine. And then the large intestine's job is to move this material through the large, the different sections of the large intestine, at the same time uh, reabsorbing water and bicarbonate ion. So it's important that our stool stays in the large intestine long enough to reabsorb the water and take it back to the blood. 
At the same time, we don't want to leave, allow for the stool to stay in here the, too long because it also can re result in constipation because this water absorption continues until the stool is evacuated from the colon via a bowel movement. So the longer it stays in there, the harder and drier that stool will get. So we need to have a good balance between a good water intake and having regular bowel movements by having enough fiber in our diet to keep the stool soft and stimulating um, peristalsis. High amounts of stress can slow peristalsis or it can stimulate peristalsis. Some people get the diarrhea when they're very stressed out. Other people get constipated, constipated when they have a high amount of stress in their lives. So trying to balance our stress and keep a good diet and have enough water coming into our system is important for healthy bowel function. So the different parts of the large intestine we talked about um, in lab. I'll just kind of focus on the rectum and the anal canal. When we have the urge to have a bowel movement, it's not until the walls of the rectum are, are distended as stool moves into them. Or in kids, we see what's called the gastrocolic reflex, which means that as the food is, enters the stomach and stretches the walls of the stomach, that stimulates peristalsis and movement of stool from the rectum out of the body. So there's a couple of different reflexes that stimulate bowel movements one depending on the stretch of the rectum, the other depending on the stretch of the stomach. So the voluntary um, allowance of stool out of the body is a result of an external anal sphincter, which is made up of skeletal muscle that we can voluntarily control when that stool will leave our body. If people are chronically constipated and they strain too much in the process of moving stool out of their rectum and anal canal, they can end up with hemorrhoids. And these are enlarged veins that become inflamed and they can actually protrude through the anal opening and cause bleeding and pain in people that, uh, when they're having a bowel movement. So it's important that people don't overly strain to have bowel movements and try to just manage their diet or use stool softeners to keep that stool soft and able to be evacuated from the body easily without too much straining and increasing the risk for hemorrhoids. So a major secretion of the large intestine is mucus. Again, that helps move things through the digestive tract, helps to protect the walls of the large intestine from damage, and also um, important for preventing constipation. We also see exchange of uh, hydrogen and sodium occurring in the large intestine and bicarbonate and chloride ions within the large intestine. So there's important um, ion regulation that occurs in the large intestine as well. We know the large intestine contains bacteria. Um, we know some people like to take probiotics like the yogurt Activia has a large number of healthy bacteria that promote good bowel function. Um, and if we eat too much um, preservative-laden foods and sugary foods, starches like potato chips, cookies, um, high-fat foods, that um, promotes overgrowth of the bad bacteria in our digestive tract and can cause increasing amounts of flatus, which is gas that builds up in the digestive tract in the colon and can cause discomfort. And it has a bad smell because of the bacteria, because of the chemicals the bacteria produce in breaking down these foods. So we see these mass movements within 16 to 24 hours after eating. We see um, uh, movement of stool out of the body, um, commonly after meals because of the gastrocolic reflex, but as we age, that gastrocolic reflex becomes less active and it's more the movement of stool into the rectum that causes the defecation reflex and stimulates a bowel movement in adults. So here we see the action of these reflexes as the stomach is stretched after a, you know, during and after a meal. That stimulates movements within the large intestine for someone to have a bowel movement. The same thing with the rectum as that's stretched, that stimulates movement out of the body for a bowel movement. So uh, we know that there's other stimulants of the colon. For example, caffeine is a stimulant of the colon. People find once they have their morning cup of coffee, they feel the urge to have a bowel movement. And that's the action of caffeine on the large intestine. So as we age, we see several changes occurring in the digestive tract. And one of those is a decrease in the production of mucus. We talked about that with the respiratory system. Um, thick, stickier mucus results in um, 
more a higher incidence of respiratory infections, but also in the digestive tract with less mucus, we see more issues with damage to the digestive tract. We might see ulcers. Uh, we might see more constipation as uh, stool has a harder time moving through the digestive tract. We see slower digestion, um, people having trouble with acid reflux disease, and having really to watch what they eat and avoiding, avoiding foods that are high in acid content, such as orange juice, coffee, um, even chocolate can irritate acid reflux. And because there's less mucus, food poisoning becomes more of a risk for people with less mucus production as the bacteria in our food invade the digestive tract and can cause widespread infection. A common bacteria that has been related to acid reflux disease is Helicobacter pylori. And there's a lot of research going on that people with ulcers actually have a bacterial infection that could be treated with antibiotics and that would resolve their, their ulcers. And that concludes our discussion of the digestive system.